Hey guys, welcome back to my channel for another episode of Redemption. And for those of you who have not seen my Redemption before, the idea of this series is to highlight people who royally fucked their life up and then turn it around. So stories like Mike Tyson, Danny Trejo, those types of things. And today I'm super excited. I'm going to be interviewing Straight Felon. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I've never done anything like this. Yeah, I just, I don't know, I, I I don't even know how you popped up on my Twitter feed, but you did, but then I started looking through, and I was like, okay, all right, I, I got a feeling there's a lot to this story here. And yeah. Like, your mindset and the entrepreneurial side of you, and I don't know. Thank you. So, let's start back at the beginning of the story. Like, very, very beginning, like, growing up. Yeah. Um, so I came from like a pretty good family, specifically my grandparents were very affluent, very successful. Uh, when I say that's like my dad's side of the family, I'm not close really with my mom's side, but you know, I grew up going to the Bahamas and, and all this, you know, all these great things. And yeah, I was like a lonely kid and like looking back, I can point out some problems, but you know, I've been through, I've seen a lot of people with problems like mine and I really, you know, compared to the usual story, I, I had a really charmed childhood, you could say. Okay. Yeah. So no major like trauma or fucked up shit or anything like I that? No, I was just very lonely. Um, you know, I went to a gifted school, so I lived a little farther away. So when school ended, it was just kind of go home and go on the computer, which, uh, you know, that's kind of, I think, what fueled my addiction was, uh, you know, it was like a whole social scene just built into using. Gotcha. And how old are you now? I'm 33. Yeah, that's my that's the real age. <laughs> Still a baby. <laughs> yeah. OK, so the Internet was around when you were a kid then. Oh, and I was real into it from a young age. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Because when I was a kid, there was like AOL chat rooms. Like, well, yeah. where was it at for you? Yeah, that was like, I remember, you know, the first internet experience was were AOL and like downloading porn back then. It was like Kazaa, Napster, WinMX, stuff like that. Yeah, but I was like, obviously pretty precocious. Like I was on there at 11, 12, 13, you know, so the average person my age wasn't. Yeah, I was really a computer guy. Gotcha. Yeah. And do you feel like, how do you feel like that impacted you being exposed to that so young? Because for me, when I was that age, I had like the Sears catalog. That was it. Yeah. No. Uh, well, yeah, I have definitely opinions on that. Cause I remember like, you know, spending hours to download a short clip at that age versus, you know, having a cell phone now with access to everything like it. You know, I don't know. It's got to be a totally different, like it's famine versus feast. But um, no, there was something where, like I said, I grew up in this affluent family and I'm going to these nice schools and I discovered the internet back then was the wild, wild west, you know, and it wasn't so much the adult stuff, but I was just finding like subversive content and I was really drawn to like, just, I guess you'd say like the, the underside of society in a way. What do you mean when you say subversive? Because that's a very subjective word. Uh, you know, like, so back then there was like the anarchist cookbook was all over oh, the internet. Oh. And like, I had no intention of building these things, but it was like, ooh, forbidden knowledge. And then, you know, at, at the time too, especially like to be looking at porn, this was before the, every person had the hub on their phone. To be looking at porn at a young age was like, ooh, I could get in trouble doing that. You know, there was a danger factor to it that wasn't present in my regular life. Yeah, no, I get that. But do yeah. you feel like that corrupted you? No, I, you know, I've thought about this before and I always loved the challenge of not like breaking the rules for the sake of breaking the rules, but almost like reverse engineering. Um, like when I got it, when I got into like what, well, this would be skipping ahead, but when I got in trouble for selling drugs, like I said, I didn't need the money. There was something that was, 
I was drawn to about like the outlaw, you know, lifestyle of doing something different. And it's like such now that I'm older, I realize that's such a naive, like privileged point of view to think from, you know, like you don't understand the consequences at that age. Yeah. Okay. So when did your life start to veer off? I mean, so I wear contact lenses and twice I had like fallen asleep with dust on or under them. I get an eye infection, go to ready med taken care of. The third time I went to ready med and I'll never forget. I had this weird country doctor. He had like a real hairy chest. His shit was open to hear. And I'm 15 years old. And he asked me like, if I work in a sawmill, and I'm like, no. <laughs> and, uh, he, I remember he, he, at the end of the thing, he's like, stay away from sawmills. And I'm like, okay. But anyways, he wrote me 10 days worth of antibiotics and 30 days worth of Vicodin. And this is a very common story. This was like that era, 2006, where they were over prescribing. That said, like I said, I grew up, you know, into that stuff. I was well aware of what Vicodin was. I was well aware that there were quack doctors, that this was a, a current problem going on in America that I just became a part of. I knew all of that and that I didn't really need Vicodin, that it was addictive. You know, so I don't play this like, you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, I didn't know. I blame the doctor. No, I, I knew what was happening. Yeah, no, that's that's an interesting one, though. In I know this is not politically correct to say this, mm -hmm. and I'm fucking terrible about being politically correct, but Me I too. agree with you 100% that, like, a lot of people love to be like, oh, well, I had no idea. And it's like, I give you a giant <laughs> piece of chocolate cake and be like, hey, dude, I took out the calories. Are you going to believe that? Yeah, You're yeah. Like, no way, dude. This shit tastes way too good. This is not good. That's, right? I mean, there's not just that, but I look from, like, even from a level of, you don't have to be a scientist. I, there's jokes about Vicodin and painkiller addiction on two and a half men. Unless you're Amish, you're aware that painkillers are addictive. This has been known for a long time. And then, like you said, there is just a natural uh, common sense of that's not this. Oh, I take this pill and I just feel super. There's no. Oh, yeah. There's no downside to this. Like, yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, it's you got to put two and two together. I mean, yeah. I remember the first time I took a pain pill. I was like, holy crap, this feels amazing. Yeah. But I know exactly where this road's going to lead. Yeah. You keep taking it. See, but, that what with me, it was, I, uh, you know, I just would do all kinds of mental gymnastics of like, I just found the, the secret hack, the cheat code for life. And that's why I don't get, there's a common thing where people will be like, oh, so-and-so introduced so-and-so to opiates. And I don't, it, trust me, a lot of times it is nefarious, but not always. A lot of the time back then, our, my friends and I, we thought we discovered something like, oh no, you know, the rest of the world is wrong. Like we got it right. It was just like it, it's really easy to delude yourself. Like, oh, this pill cost me $3. I just need $3 every day to feel great forever. And you, you know, you think it's going to be that simple. Yeah. So what was the secret that you guys figured out that no one else had? No, that we, had, no, that like, uh, we, we thought like when I took that pill, I thought I discovered something good. Like, no people, I want to tell my friends about this. This pill is awesome. It feels oh. so good. Like, it's not always a nefarious, like, oh, I want to bring you down with me and get you addicted. Like, I really yeah. thought I had discovered something that the rest of society was wrong about for some reason. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I, I've done a YouTube monologue on this, but I, I'm curious if this played into your uh, thought process. I, I've always believed that the most dangerous thought someone can have and that it leads to drug addiction, screwed up relationships is I'm different. It won't happen to me. I'm not like everybody else. Like, did that play into it for you? Oh yeah, of course. It's and it's weird because I think about this and it's like, what exactly did I think? Because I, I I wasn't a super confident guy. I know I wasn't like, oh, I have more willpower than all those guys. It's just, I don't know. It has that. It has addiction has a way of like creeping into that core, like that first thought process, and from there filtering everything out into whatever mental gymnastics. So you reach that conclusion of, yeah, this is a good idea to take this right now. Cause yeah, there really is no, like I said, I, I wasn't a, I was overweight. I wasn't confident in myself. I, I didn't think like, Oh yeah, I got this under control. I just really didn't think about it at all. Wow. Yeah. You were overweight back then. 
Yeah, I wish to, I think the biggest I ever was was 265 in maybe the eighth grade of all fat. Never played sports. Like I said, I went to a nerd high school. But then I got I got down to where I was just chubby until prison. Oh, uh, okay. And yeah. How tall are you? Six foot. Oh, okay. All yeah. Right. So, all right. So, so you start taking these pills. You're thinking to yourself, okay, three dollars a day. Oh, that's that's sustainable long term. Yeah. Well, here's yeah. the thing though: is I took that first pill. The next day, I took two. The next day, I took three. You know, and it topped out at five or six. But then, uh, like I said, I was a kid. I went to a nerdy school. I didn't have access to it. Um, this more plays into the story. So about, I think about six months went by. And like I said, nobody at my school partied. There was one girl, um, who was always kind of, I was always kind of cool with. And she invited me over one night. And I remember we had, I drank like a shot of UV blue and they had like a cash bowl of weed. And I went to school the next day. And this is the kind of school I went to. Like nobody would talk to me. Like that was like a very bad thing to do. And yeah, there's, there's one kid at my school that went half day that was like clearly the stoner kid and he did not fit into my school. And I thought, you know, this seems like, you know, why not? Of course, that's the person I gravitated towards. And it was, this is why it went so bad is it was exactly what I thought it would be. I met all kinds of people. I was invited to all kinds of parties. Instead, it used to be me trying to look for people to go hang out with. Now people were calling me. I was like, you know, I was... And it wasn't just because of drugs. Like I was having a legitimate good time, but I associated it with they only like me because of the drugs. And that's where I took it. Gotcha. So where yeah. were you getting the drugs from? So like I said, I was really big into the internet. Before I ever even touched a drug, I was on a lot of drug websites. And back then, uh, online pharmacies were just kind of like going out. Like you couldn't do that anymore. But there was a scene of there was all these message boards where people would review online pharmacies. One I was on was called OPR, Online Pharmacy Review. And once all the online pharmacies closed down, people just started selling whatever on there. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. I never, I didn't even do anything, but it was crazy seeing like this, these criminal enterprises. There was something, you know, it was like, I was like, Goodfellas, you know, the movie as a kid, there was, it was cool to see that. So when I met these kids that smoked weed, I remember the first night I showed them this website and we ordered like some hash and ketamine and, you know, all kinds of, and then of course, you know, I'm from the small town. I'm the most popular kid all of a sudden. Jesus. Yeah. yeah, no, it, it sounds like you're really like the poster child of, you know, there's a million ways to say it, but kids grow up to be who their friends are. Yeah. You're at the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. And it just yeah. sounds like getting involved with that, the wrong crowd. Yeah. And I think yeah. the problem is just with my mindset, they were like into drugs. So I latch on to them, but then I take it to the next level. Like they just are okay with doing drugs. I'm like, no, I want to be involved in selling these too. You know, I just, I didn't have growing up with, you know, in that fantasy world, like with the affluent family, they always bailed me out of trouble. I just, I had no real, that, that true, like fear of God, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I get it. Yeah. So would you say that you've always had the type of personality where it's like, okay, stuff's here. Let's take it up a notch or let's go a little bit further. Let's push the envelope. Yeah. And especially like I even see it with the only fans now, like I don't live in a major metro area. So there's like some people to collaborate with around here. And I'm like, okay, let's go now. Let's go tomorrow. Let's do more. Like, do you want to, if your stuff naked body is going to be out there, man, why would you not want to do it to the fullest? You know? Yeah. yeah. I get it. I mean, I, I think that's either an amazing quality or really, <laughs> really bad quality, depending on how you channel it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just don't like to take things half serious, I guess. Yeah. So you're hanging out with this crowd. We're getting really deep into drugs. Then what happens? So now the Vicodins switch to like Oxy. And this is when the money aspect, the dealing stops becoming like, oh, I'm kind of doing this to be cool and becomes like, okay, I need this to sustain this habit. I remember I was still in high school and it was at the point where I could, I could sit down and do two or three OC 80s, which were about 30 or 40 bucks back then, which is cheap for in one sitting. And I'm 17 years old. And you know, it just basically gets to the point where there is no limit on, you know, like 
$700 a day would have been like what I could have done. I just never had enough money to do my limit. And uh, like, and with the taking things over the top, I was never a guy who was like, oh, I'm going to split my pill up into eight pieces throughout the day. I, I want to do it until it's gone and then I'll figure out a way to get more and then I'll do that till it's, I'm not saving any. Yeah. Like that's how I always was. I don't have self-control. Like with the diet and exercise, it's different with opiates. It's beyond that. Wow. Yeah. Damn. That 700 bucks a day. I mean, that's, I'm just estimating. Cause I remember that's like, I'm sitting down and snorting a hundred bucks and then I'm getting up and we're going to do so. That's not like enough to nod out. And that's like, you know, a half an hour. I'm saying, you know, it, it could probably go up to that high. I mean, the fentanyl is especially bad with that. Just, um, in terms of like, you know, you, you're doing it for a week and you notice like I'm doing 20 times as much as I did when I started this binge. There's just really no like mathematical limit. Yeah. So it just keeps going and going and going and going and going. Yeah, basically as much as you can. You know, I, I met about one other dude who could take it as hard as I did, as hard as I go in my day. And he had a good job, too. And I remember one time we picked up $900 at like 2 p.m., 3 p.m. And we're like, this is going to last us two days, which is insanely sick thinking, <laughs> like $900 in two days. Man, we went back out to the city that night. Like after he had a, he had a deposit hit at midnight, we were going back out. Yeah. Okay. So at what point did you, or did you at all ever feel like, holy shit, this is spiraling. Like this is not sustainable long-term. The criminal, it was, I mean, the opiates, it wasn't until my twenties. Like uh, I had the criminal stuff happen and I would for years and I would still justify the addiction. So you want me to get into like how I originally got caught? Yeah. Like how old were you when that happened? So I had started selling on that OPR forum, basically the stuff that was available online, the, you know, LSD, these real, real exotic things, I would get those and sell them locally. Then I would buy, you know, more traditional stuff locally and sell it online. I had this back and forth. So anyways, one of my first packages, um, a guy got like a half gram of soft from me and he, they tried to make him sign for the package, which was commonplace back then. It doesn't, it didn't mean anything, but he got spooked rejected the package and I had used a fake return address. I didn't know that's, you shouldn't do that. You should use a real return address because who uses a fake return address? So they see the return address is fake. They flag it as a suspicious package, handwritten envelope, all this stuff. There's all these qualifiers that makes the package suspicious. I didn't know this back then. So they have a drug dog smell the package, even though I had vacuum sealed everything doesn't matter. So Yeah. yeah, the drug dog alerts on my package, uh, They open it, find it. They don't know who it is. I mean, there's DNA fingerprints, but like I said, I'm a kid. They flag the fake. What? Sorry, what is soft? Oh, like powder cocaine. I get some of these platforms, you can't say stuff. So I'm like, yeah, you you have to dance around it. Yeah. So anyways, um, so that name, the name, fake name, Casey Holland gets flagged. Uh, about a year goes by and I actually start picking up in business. Like the, when I got busted, I think I was dropping off seven packages in one day. And I happened to be using the name, like a variation of Casey Holland. And it was at a post office where the lady working happened. Like when I was a kid grew up across the street from me. So she had a vague idea who I was and could put it together. So all those packages got stopped in the process and across all of them, there was about a quarter pound of weed, 44 oxys, and then there was the original half gram of cocaine. And uh, I remember, ooh, so I had a dealer had fronted me all those oxys and I did them all. And so, you know, I owed him a bunch of money. He calls me to his house after school. I owe him $2,000 and I'm scared. I'm with my friend. And we, we go to his house. His girlfriend answers the door. She's covered in bruises. She, he was a bad wife beater. And we go in the house. It's cold. He has some folding chairs sat up in the living room and we're like waiting for him. And as he's walking in, I get a call from my family saying that the house is being raided. And uh, he ended up not doing anything. He actually was trying to give me more weed to sell. And I was like, no, this is not what I, that's the last thing I want in my possession right now. But yeah, I remember it was just like the most surreal moment in my life. uh, Hearing like the fantasy world had finally interfered with reality. Damn. So did your family have any idea up to this point? No, not that I was even doing drugs. So you're able to hide all of this. No, it's actually weird. I don't know if I think maybe my brain chemistry or like 
you know, as you get further in addiction, like originally back in the day, I could take a Vicodin and I'd be moving around, but I was fully euphoric. Once I got so far into it, I would have to be like nodded out until I felt euphoria. So I think maybe back in the day, I just wasn't taking so much. I don't know. But it went, once I reached like my mid to late 20s, if I licked a Xanax, my family could tell. So, yeah, there was something weird where may, maybe they were just giving me the benefit of the doubt because later it wasn't like that. But it was bizarre what I got away with looking back, you know, and I, I smelling like weed, all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, so they bust you for the coke and all this shit. What the fuck did they charge you with? What did you get? Like, okay, so uh, I didn't go to jail right away from that. I come home, cops are yelling at me, they're screaming, they're doing the whole. I remember the one of them was like, "We're gonna take your computer and find all the illegal porn." I was like, "Wait, what? What are you talking?" Then the guy like, you know, asked for a lawyer and he's screaming, saying, "I'm gonna live in a trailer park the rest of my life." Very like threatening. But anyways, they leave and the warrant comes through. I think two months later, and I'm literally in my high school uh, lunchroom, and my dad comes and pulls me out. I had to turn myself in. I got charged with thirteen counts. Um, of like delivery manufacturer, one cocaine, like maybe six weed and six oxy, something like that. And I'm in the holding cell and I'm in there with a guy who has 14 counts, criminal sexual conduct, first degree persons under six. We both go in front of the magistrate at the same time. And the magistrate doesn't comment on his charges, gives him a $5,000 bond. The magistrate calls me dope dealing scum and sets my bond at 25,000, five, five times the, the, the child rate. And that's when I like immediately, that was like a good foreshadowing of like how bad I was going to get screwed. Jesus. Yeah. So I'm guessing parents bonded you out. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then immediately what, what, what happened when you got out? So we had already kind of went through the whole emotional family scene from when I originally got busted. At this point, we we're kind of like in preparation. So they had hired like a $50,000 lawyer out of Detroit, uh, Michael Manley. It's, you know, everybody has those regional lawyers that are like, you know, really good. Not an ambulance chase, so like a guy that's pretty good. And, but there's only so much a lawyer can do for an open and shut. Like I walked into a post office with packages. <laughs> like you can't, there's no denying it. You know, what is he just going to be that charismatic? Like cut him a deal. Come on. So I ended up getting a uh, six months in County, five years probation, but this, and this is a big, but I got to do my County time on work release. So I went to work with my family every day. So that I thought I was doing real time, but in reality it was easy. Yeah. Yeah. So then I get out and I, I obviously I didn't learn my lesson. Um, I, I think I used an oxy the day I got out, but also back then, I don't know if it was cause I was so young or I didn't mess up yet. Probation was just not on me at all. Like not testing me at all. I was smoking weed and everything of those five years. I think two years in, I failed the test. They gave me another six months in County of which I was on work site. So I got to go do work for the County, got my sentence cut in half. So once again, I didn't do the full experience. So then that last time I was four, I was four out of five years into my probation. I was 22 years old and I got another violation. And at that point I had done technically two, six months terms I had been sentenced to, which means I had done a year. And once you do a year, any more time than that is prison. So the judge had an option. He could have gave me like one last chance, gone to a program. And originally that's what I was promised. <laughs> but then when I got went, went to go get sentenced, it was a different judge and he wasn't talking about the same deal. So yeah, I got what sent was it. your violation for? Oh, dirties. I always drop dirty. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I was still using. Yeah. Gotcha. So then I get sentenced to 23 months in prison with about 13 credit. So in my mind, I only have like 10 months to do in prison, potentially, because I assumed I would get my first parole since I had such a nonviolent case from a couple of years ago. So I went in my in my head in prison, I didn't have two years to do until I did the two years. I found out. Oh, shit. Yeah. Damn. So so that's like a major shock. So county jail is infinite, infinitely different than prison. Some people know the difference. Um, county jail, you're locked just in a little cell all day. Prison is what you see in the movies, walk in the yard and all that. And now 
while prison is has way more capacity for violence and extortion and all these bad things, it's also not so mind numbingly boring. You're not trapped in a room all day. So it was, you know, when I first walked on that prison yard and could just walk around outside, basically free to me compared to being in the cell, dude, it was like I had seen the light. It was like, oh, my God, finally. Now it's not like I'm just staring at the clock, watching it move. Like, don't get me wrong. It sucked. But there wasn't like the painful psychic torture of time going by slow. Yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. But also there's uh, every type of vice you could want in prison. And like I said, I, my family was, you know, they have money and not only that, but they're a bit of enablers and I was manipulative. I, uh, you know, I used they basically always, the whole, I was going to say, so you always had money on your books. Oh, not I, not just that, but I mean, the money was, I was just eating like a king separate than that. Um, I remember I went about six months without doing it, but people would, when they would want to buy larger amounts of contraband, they wouldn't use the food. They would have their baby mama, their mom, whatever, send a Western Union or just send money to a person from the world to another person from the world. And it would be like the baby mama of another inmate. So I remember something had hit the yard. I think it was some dope. And I just, I did it. I came up with a story about how I got in a fight and I broke a TV and, uh, you know, I need you to go and get this green dot number. And I knew, I knew that once I do this, it's not going to be, I'm going to keep doing it. And I must have broke 50 TVs throughout my stay after that. It was like roadhouse, according to me. Jesus. Yeah. One of the saddest, like, that's one of the things I really regret is like the manipul, not the man- the money, because my grandma had the money. It was like the over and over. It was that she had to see so many years of it. I remember uh, when I got out of prison, if anybody knows green dot cards, it's like you go to Walmart, you buy a green dot card for $200, scratch the number off, then somebody can load the 200. So anyways, I went in a drawer and there was a stack of these green dot cards. Each one of them is $200. And it's, a, it's like a pinochle deck. <laughs> it's so big. You know, and I just like, I didn't even want to count how much money I possibly spent in there on drugs. It's, you know, it's disgust me. The number of phone calls and excuses is what disgusts me, you know? Yeah. So it wasn't the money. It was the manipulation of her. Yeah. Well, you also have to think too, people don't realize it's very bad to be an addict in prison because in the world you got to have money. Now don't get me wrong. If you know your dealer, they might front you something, but in prison, you, nobody really has money. Everything is done on credit. Like if you want to buy something substantial, it's you take it and then your family pays for it. So that's just, it's so easy to be like, okay, I want something today. For, like I'll, I'll get this $300 debt and I'll figure it out tomorrow. I'll make the phone call tomorrow and I'll worry about it tomorrow. And I would just get in this cycle where, because I didn't have to make that phone call right away, I could use the product first and then make the phone call. You know, yeah. it was a bad and did she ever say what the fuck <sighs> yeah well here's the thing i think there was my grandma was a little bit naive but i think there was kind of an unsaid thing where even though i'm coming up with this excuse like yeah i broke this guy's tv and owe him money that she knew that what i'm basically saying is i owe somebody money and i am in danger so i'm not you know i'm not lying about that obviously i think she knew i was in danger because I put myself in that debt. It wasn't a random incident, like I said, but the overall message, I think she understood. Yeah. Cause it's the that same. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. Well, she wanted to protect you. She exactly. You were okay. And that's, what's the bad part is like people, you know, they, you're literally putting yourself in danger just to get high and asking people to bail you out over and over. Yeah. So I'm assuming then you used up until the point you got out. Yeah, I literally. So, you know, stuff comes and goes in there, but Suboxone was pretty much always around. That was definitely the drug of choice for years in there Um, because that could come in through the mail. If anybody doesn't know what that is, it's kind of looks like a little uh, Listerine strip. So you can imagine with envelopes and just how flat, you know, you can think of it behind stamps, whatever. Um, I think they totally changed over the mail system. So they photocopy everything now. But anyways, back then, uh, it was pretty much always available, but there was a drought like the week before I was going home and only one guy had stuff. And usually it was like 10 bucks a milligram. 
uh, this guy was whacking like, I think like 50 bucks a milligram. And I was literally physically addicted. So I had to give this guy like a hundred dollars every day for the last week, just to get a little tiny crumb to stay well. And I remember getting out of prison and like, you know, my body could not help but be elated to be out of prison and to be comforted to be home. But it was surreal because like, you know, my, I was in withdrawal. Like I literally, like I was happy, but I did not feel good because just physically I couldn't, I was, you know, depleted of dopamine or whatever. So it's a, it was a weird thing to be out of prison and feeling bad. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. I, I've never been addicted. Thank God. Yeah. So, I mean, but I've heard enough stories to, to, get an idea of what it's like and i just i can't even imagine and i mean the way it's always been put to me is that once you get far enough in your addiction you basically have to use in order to feel the way i feel just yeah normally yeah and it gets to a point like what what you were just saying what what kills me about the addiction one of the worst parts is how bad just your regular level of, I guess you would say like happiness chemicals gets. That's what would kill me. I would get sober and I'd get past the physical sickness. I'd get past the body aches, but your brain doesn't heal like that. You know, a normal person feels, you know, really good moods and bad moods. And just, it's hard to imagine what if you felt like that, that, that mundane shitty feeling that you only feel sometimes. What if it was like that all the time? Just, it's hard until you felt it, what it feels like to have your baseline chemistry totally altered to where it's just hard to live. That's why I would relapse. I would end up tapping out. Like I just, I would white knuckle it and I do everything they told me, but there was just on a base level, I did not feel happy for significant amounts of time. White knuckle refers to just. Yeah. Like riding it out, you know, okay. cause I, I would hate the consequences when I would relapse, I would hate the consequences. So I'd come back from a relapse and I'd be like, man, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to be homeless. Like all that bad stuff. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to grit it through not feeling good. Maybe if I get to 60 days clean, my brain will repair. And, it, it, you know, and it just it still wouldn't. So when you got out, were you done done or were you still on parole? Oh, yeah, on parole. But here was the crazy thing is parole was so much easier than probation. Like I said, I failed a drug test and they sent me to prison for two years. Um, I, I used to fail drug tests on parole and like, Usually not get in trouble. If I did get in trouble, it was like a 10 day violation. Go to jail for 10 days. Jesus. Yeah. So it was a lot. And, and also too, um, the heroin problem had really taken over my area. When I, when I, before I went to prison, I used to drive from mid Michigan to Detroit. And when I got, I never went to Detroit after I got out. It was all right around me. So it was very easy to fall back into this like, Floor, everything was way better and it was way cheaper and there was 10 guys selling it instead of one in Saginaw and where I'm from, you know, it was, uh, yeah, I got back into it with a vengeance. That's when I got into speed balls exclusively. Like before I would do them, especially if both were available, I'd do them. But at that point, like everybody, the, there's kind of in my city, there was one organization that had taken over in that time period and everybody had both dope and Coke. And I just, I had to have both every time. And that, that leads to a like even quicker deterioration. So speedball is heroin and Coke. Yeah. Heroin and Well, around here it would be heroin and crack just because that's what they sell. But yeah, heroin, cocaine, heroin, and crack. Yeah. And one, in one go, it's kind of like like one's taking you way up. One's trying to take you way down. So when they cancel each other out, well, here's the thing. When you slam cocaine, some people love it. But for me, it's always way too over. Like your ears ring, you get tunnel vision, you feel like you're going to die. And for me, I get a unbelievable paranoia of thinking like the SWAT team is about, about, about to breach my door and people are in the bushes. So the dope takes that away. And it's still like super intense. And then uh I don't know. It is. It's. The problem is, though, there is a little canceling out in the, in the sense that, yeah, it makes each one not so strong and then they make each other wear off quicker. So you just you end up going through exponentially more money. Jesus. Yeah. So you're doing this while you're on parole. Yeah. And um, pretty much, you know, I knew this is the sad thing is I knew exactly when I was going to drop and I knew exactly how long it takes me to clean out. 
They never once surprised me and showed up at my house and they'd still get me. That's the craziness is I'd make, you know, I would make a story in my head about how this is going to be the one time he doesn't drop me when I walk in there or how he's, it's going to be the one time he lets me off the hook for some reason. Wow. That's, and where were you living at the time? Uh, with my grandparents. So this will be, uh, I'll transition, this transitions to when I first lived on my own. Um, I did get a violation where I went back to jail on that. I uh, was living on Tether and I, my girlfriend, I think, spent the night at my mom's and I had to, I was trying to go get, go there to have sex with her, but I had done a bunch of dope. So I had an idea, like, I'll take a, a Viagra and I'll go over there, but I only had so much out time on my Tether. And it's at the point where I'm at my mom's and I got to go back home in about half an hour and I still haven't taken this Viagra. So I break half of it down, crush it and snort it. And the last thing I remember was, you know, like kind of pill falling out of my nose, getting on top of my girlfriend. And then I wake up to the EMTs around me and I had, uh, I don't know, like, you know, they say don't mix the boner pills with real drugs. And there's a reason for that. And I'd OD'd on top of her and she had to yell for my mom to come peel me off. The EMTs come and for a minute it was looking like they were just going to take me to the hospital and not get the police involved. But I was naked and they saw my tether and sure enough, I ended up, uh, I did like 105 days over that one. And then I uh, paroled out and I lived in a different city with that girlfriend. And once I lived in a city outside of a rural area, that's when I said they stopped caring about dirties, never got in trouble. As long as you weren't actively breaking the law, they were kind of cool with you. And I got off, it was summer of 2016. I got off parole and I was off papers for, I think, four months before I was back on. Since Bush was in office, I've been on papers other than those four months. Jesus. Yeah. It's sad. I, you know, people are asking me to collaborate now. And, you know, I have like 30 different parole guidelines. And one of them is may not leave the state. And that was always like the least important one. You know, I was always like, man, let me smoke weed. But now when I think about it, man, like I haven't been able to leave the state in over a decade. And now I'm literally getting offers to. And that 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 really gets to me, man. Like that's one of the, the real resentments I hold, like in terms of like, I don't think I deserved that punishment, you know, for what I did. So, but can't you get a travel permit? Yeah, but so a lot of people don't know. I, I keep remembering I have a PO who is not so big on the trans women. So like uh, my PO has stood in my front lawn screaming in my face. That is a man. You are gay. You are a gay man. Isn't that like a crate? Like it, she's my probation officer. So, you know, based on that, I don't think she is that big of a fan of the adult stuff. She has given me permission to like go within state and stay out a little bit longer than usual, but I don't see her letting me travel state for this. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you never know. You can always ask. Oh yeah. I don't, I don't have a problem. This. Yeah, I will. I just, <laughs> so was that the last time you were in prison then? Yeah. So, there's prison and then a lot of my stories take place in parole violator camp programs. Um, that's like a step before prison. Like once you get out in Michigan, at least they do, they do kind of try to do what they can not to send you back. So I've done over a year of time just in parole violation programs. And then I went the last time I went to jail, I had to turn myself in. Um, so what I'm in trouble for now, um, October 30th, 2019, I was back on probation for possession. I had relapsed. I was really bad on fentanyl. And I, I ordered some fentanyl to my house from my, my dude. Keep in mind, I'm on tether. I can't even leave my garage. I unplugged my driveway alarm so my dude could pull up without it going off. Do the exchange. Obviously, I do some. I forget to turn the driveway alarm back on. I get on a treadmill because that's what I would do. I just get high and walk on my treadmill all day. And I don't hear the probation task force coming to the house. I remember I heard like a radio beeping and saw a flashlight and immediately I knew who it was. And I had like a little pebble of fentanyl in my, the cup holder of the treadmill. And for some reason I ignored it and I tried to hide like the syringes and stuff and they burst in and tackled me. And uh, so originally I thought I'm going to jail for sure. I'm so high. I can't even pee to do the drug test. And they told me to, report to probation the next day. And I just couldn't believe it. So of course I'm so strung out right now. I can't kick in jail. So I shot a move to the psych ward. 
um, you know, just made that phone call. And from there I got um, into it. How does that happen? Oh, I just was like, hey, I, I just swallowed a bunch of pills and they take you to the psych ward. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. And that's something I had done a few times before. Like if you like if I was dirty and I didn't want to go in for a violation and get drug tested, I would shoot a move to the psych ward, as I say. And they can't really like with HIPAA, they knew what I did and they'd be on my ass, but they couldn't really get me in trouble for it. Gotcha. So from there, they got me into okay, a treat. So that- oh. All right. There. Oh, so I got into a treatment center, and then while this was all up in the air, COVID happened. So I basically sat in limbo with warrants for two years, and then in 2000, I think it would have been 21, I turned myself in. I had to do like 10 days in jail, and then I got on probation for this. So yeah, I, a lot of people don't understand. I'm, I'm not like fresh out of prison or anything. It's been a while since I've done significant time. Gotcha. So basically, it all stemmed from that original thing, and it just keeps getting extended. Yeah. I mean, every time I'm, I, I have a big problem where when I get like a, a, a step up in freedom, I immediately go crazy. Like getting off parole, I started getting into, you know, dealing again, uh, dabbling my feet. And that's how I got caught. Uh, I got pulled over and I had a bunch of pills and tried to swallow them. Um, or like there's been so many times where I get the tether off my ankle and immediately relapse from like the increase of freedom. Uh, you know, what I think is different this time is I've never, uh, I never had anything to lose. You know, people talk about how bad addiction is, but I could tolerate that, especially with when, when I had the drugs, you could tolerate anything living on the streets. It was when I would get clean, I, I wouldn't have anything in my life that I really cared about losing. It was always very empty. No, that makes sense. I, fuck. I'm just thinking about it. I don't know. It just, it, your story reminds me, though, of just so many people where it's like once you get involved in the legal system, you just never get out. It's just one thing after another after another. Like, especially with like ISP probation, intensive supervision. Yeah. You know, yep. You get put on that, you might as well consider that shit a life sentence. Mother Teresa would violate that shit. It's also, uh, it's, it's people don't realize how regional it is. Like where I'm from in Michigan, I can, I will, I could stay in the system my whole life solely from being an addict. If you live in like Portland, San Francisco, LA, you aren't going to prison for just having a baggie in your pocket. Around here, you are. Like the, the bar for, you know, being in the system forever is very low. It's basically like just being an addict will keep you in the system. You don't have to victimize others. Yeah. So when did your life, cause I, and we'll talk about that. I'm sure in yeah. a minute about the having something to lose. I think yeah. that's the biggest thing. So, and just to clarify for the people watching, tether means you have a GPS ankle monitor. Yes. Pull it out here. Yeah. So and contrary to like a little like DVD looking. No, no. Monitor. So those are, those are the old ones that were radio. So those could only tell if you were within 30 feet of the box. This is fully GPS. Oh. So I'm allowed out. Like I'm allowed out from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. But they can see where I am. Oh, wow. Technology's come away. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So 2019, that happens. What happens after that between, because you said there were warrants. Like, yeah. Did they just not come arrest you during COVID or? Yeah, they weren't really taking anybody. So I had uh, went up to that rehab and I do like my 60 days in rehab, but then like, I wasn't really feeling turning myself in in jail. So I went to their sober house and that's when COVID happened. And then, yeah, for, I think it was like two years until I finally got a hold of my PO. I was just, so for two years, I lived up North and basically bounced back and forth in these sober houses, um, you know, getting kicked out. Like I would relapse on Kratom and stupid shit like that. Smoking weed, get kicked out. And it was just, and cause like I said, 
I had a tether on my ankle and warrants. Like I didn't know what was going to happen the next day, next month. So it was like, why do I don't want to try to put down stakes and make something in my life. It was really easy to justify screwing up. So you only saw right here. Yeah, exactly. Long term. Oh, well, I was waiting for the other shoe to drop. I, you know, remember, I just, the police came to my house, found fentanyl while I'm on probation. I, I couldn't even pass the drug test. And then I ran away to rehab on top of it. So then, you know, the world gets shut down for COVID. So at first I was like, oh, they don't care about me at all. But then after a year, you know, things had kind of got put together a little bit. And I was like, ah, they might come for me sometime now, you know, and it, So it's just, I felt like the other shoe was always about to drop. It was hard. It was hard to make any plans. So when did things finally like turn around for you and start to, so okay, enough of this fucking around playing grab ass shit. So when I finally turned myself in, I did those little 12, 13 days in jail, which was the worst (laughs) days I ever did. I'm too old to go back. That's another thing I realized. I could tolerate it a lot better when I was in my 20s. So I I really resolved not to go back, which I had done a million times before. But I go back to the sober houses. I really hated staying there. But eventually it got to the point where my family was ready to have me back. My grandma was getting quite old and needed some help with her medical appointments. So it would have been uh, January 1st, 2022. I uh, moved back, move. Yeah, that's what it was. I moved back downstate to help take care of her and move back into the old house where all this bad stuff had happened because I had gotten away. I had moved up north to kind of get away from things. There's, you know, not no city up there. There's not, not as many drugs basically. So a lot of people were really hesitant on me coming back home and I came back home and I, I stayed sober. I helped my grandma and things started changing in the sense that they trusted me more. Um, I got my tether off. Finally, I had that tether on my ankle for three years. My family helped me get a car, but I was still unbelievably lonely. I think from January until August, I might've went out and hung out with people like two Tinder dates and hung out with my ex three or four times. Other than that, I just took care of my grandma, walked to the gym, walked my dogs, just completely alone. Um, And then I met my girlfriend now. And, you know, it's, it's like a very dangerous thing when you're an addict like that to have all your eggs in one basket with a person. But it finally... You know, it kickstarted my life. I finally, at least I had somebody to talk to and it inspired me to go back into college and which I had done 10 times before, but this time I finished the semester and I did well. And like my family was proud of me. I brought this girl to Thanksgiving and they couldn't believe she has a, an amazing job working with kids. And like, they were like impressed, you know, like I would bring home like other drug users before. So uh, like my family was really, they could, they used to tell me like, we can tell you're happy. And you know, the whole time I I haven't mentioned it, but my grandma was always the most important person in my life. When I was like a little kid, I'd, I'd like ask God, please let grandma live till I was 20. And that kept pushing and pushing. And it finally got to please let grandma, like see that I'm on a good path before she dies. And, you know, and finally I felt like she did. And, uh, you know, on Christmas day, I found her dead on the floor and, you know, that was a a major upset for me. And then, you know, my girlfriend and I, we had some problems and we ended up uh, splitting around Valentine's day. And that's when I, uh, I had just finished literally right after that, I finished the drug court program, which is a lot like ISP, a program I had completed over this, this time period where we're talking about, I got it together. That's an intense program. I finished it in the minimum amount of time violation free. And I, after all that time, I had lost everything. I lost the girlfriend. Grandma's not there. And I ended up uh, relapsing hard for about three or four days and went and reported to my PO, told her everything that happened. And man, I would have, she wanted to give me the death sentence. It seemed like that's, I've had that, te- this tether on since then. And that's where my adult story kind of starts. I had about three weeks of literally just laying in bed, recovering from that binge, which was only like four days, but it took me forever. And I was stuck at the house. I had lost everything. Like I had thought I had lost everything before. And then I made that decision and really lost everything. And then uh, you want me to get into how I started gambling or anything more? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I just, I, I think the one thing that really sticks out in what you just said is you're right when you put so much into one person, if yeah. that blows up, and, like, as you were telling the story, like, okay, Grandma, oh, and I'm just sitting there in my mind, I'm like, please, God, don't tell me you relapsed. Because I, yeah. I I can just see it coming. It's like watching you walk towards the edge of that cliff and, fuck. Yeah. Okay. So your PO is livid. Yeah, and that's when she starts the uh, transphobic stuff. Like, before, she never had anything. Like, she, don't get me wrong. She wasn't, uh, you know, throwing a pride parade. But she wasn't, like, saying anything. And she cut into me vicious. Like, keep in mind, this is my probation officer. And she's talking to me about biology and, you know, where does that draw into my addiction? She said, like, two broken people can't fix each other. She's like, what is she going to do for you? I'm thinking, well, she is literally a therapist. But, anyway, you know, I mean, it was... And what was disgusting was that the implication was I'm this fucked up uh, felon drug addict. All of that is completely true. You can't debate that. But that by her just being transgender, she's not only right there next to me, she's below me and I'm too good for her. And that just I could never like my I used to really like I really like that probation officer. And I just I can't move past that. It's like showing your true colors, in my opinion. Yeah. So this girlfriend that your family loved and everything she yeah was trans, correct yeah so now yes so now here's the thing too i my family they're very conservative mostly old but they they aren't religious so i don't we didn't have a lot of that homophobia stuff but i my girlfriend you know with makeup is very passable but there's also a, a thing where with trans women where sometimes when a chick's like six foot one and with a little deep voice you don't think, oh, she doesn't pass, but you start what like looking. So I kind of yeah. wanted to avoid any potential weird t conversations. So I told my family, hey, you know, this is my girlfriend. She's a girl. You know, I know she's a little tall and has a deep voice, but she's on hormones. Please just address her as a girl. So I would have thought they put it together from that. Um, and I, I, there was even a, another comedy of miscommunication where when I introduced her to my dad, we go over there and there's two obviously older lesbians there that like aren't out they're just saying they're roommates and in our heads like as soon as we left me and my girlfriend looked at each other like did he invite them over to try to make you feel more comfortable and we're like yeah he had to have and this whole time nobody knew that my girlfriend was trans and in fact i told my mom directly and my mom was supportive and they in fact got into arguments when my mom happened to bring it up saying no she isn't so, which my, so my girlfriend on one hand, she felt really good. Like, damn, I must pass well, but obviously didn't like the sentiment. Yeah. yeah. So it actually slipped out in conversation. I happened to say something about like estrogen or HRT. And I remember my grandpa's reaction just couldn't believe it. And then he asked about another trans. He's like, is, is so-and-so trans too? And I, I thought it was like shock. Like he couldn't believe. I didn't think it was disgust. But he later, you know, expressed it in that word exactly. Damn. Yeah, it was no, rough. I, I, I've been there, but fortunately for me, I had the opposite reaction. Because, like, one of my exes, we had been together for, fuck, two, three years. And, like, my son, I, I see him every week. Yeah. And, like, one day we are all on a motorcycle ride together, and, like, it just... I was like, well, you know she's trans, right? And my son's like, really? Uh -huh. He's like, I had no idea. He's like, oh, okay. That's cool. Huh. So, yeah. It's... Yeah, I can't imagine the opposite reaction, though. I will say there is another funny reaction I get, and this one makes me feel uncomfortable, is uh, I call it, like, liberal praise. There's been – I was at a – clothing store and this lady said i you know are you two together pointing at me and my girlfriend i'm like yeah it's my girlfriend and oh that's wonderful that's just oh that's just so great support and it's i don't know maybe that's because like i've always perceived myself as straight but it always makes me feel real uncomfortable like i mean thank you but is it that big? like you must think it's a little different if you think it's that big of a deal i don't know it's always my thought yeah no i i agree with you there it's yeah like what why does it have to matter right <laughs> yeah yeah, I was just like a little too overly enthused. Yes, exactly. So, That's what. 
I was going to say my, like what drew me to trans women, I guess, like I talk about this a lot is it's not really a sexual thing. And to be honest, when I first met a trans woman, like, I think I fell into this fantasy that many people have of thinking like there's going to, there's going to be a significantly different social aspect than a cis woman. And there really wasn't like in terms of, yeah, it was, no, I think like, I think a lot of dudes like latch on to like this thing of like, oh, trans women are, I prefer them to, re- uh, to cis women because they're like more effeminate or like they try to please me more. And in my experience, when I met my girlfriend, it was kind of like I was in the presence of a cis woman. Like my brain did not register it any different than just being with a cis woman. And that was kind of what was odd to me. And that's why I wanted to show my family. I was like, isn't this kind like, dude, it's just, isn't this cool? Like, I don't know. I guess it was naive looking back, but I thought it was neat. Yeah, no, I, I, you and I are on the same page. I, I don't view them any different. And that's not even like a, oh, I'm so my moral high point. It's like a literally like, put it like this. My girlfriend, um, when I first met her, her bathroom is attached to her bedroom. So if you go in there, it sounds really loud when you're peeing. I wouldn't have cared if a dude could hear me pee. I was super self con You know, just when you're in the presence of a woman for a straight guy, you act differently than around a man. It's a subconscious reaction. I couldn't force it. You know, it was, it's, it was just inherent, you know? Okay. Yeah. But, um, I did find a social aspect where for whatever reason, the whole bad boy thing I have going on, you know, that worked women like that up until about my mid twenties. But once I hit 30, like women started expecting more, like, I don't know. Like I, I just did not, women would not give me the time of day. Like I think I'm a fairly articulate guy. I have a lot to say, but I didn't have that social status. And I found like, I just was not meeting any women, but for some reason, these trans women who were way out of my league should be dating guys. Way They were giving me the time of day. It just seemed like they were way more open-minded. Oh, actually I can, I can totally see that. Yeah. Because cause you're right, like, women typically, especially the older they get, the more they value status and money and what you do for a living and power and those types of things over. Uh, yeah, for sure. It's, uh, it, it's, I really did notice that. Like, I, I went on dates with nurses and stuff up until I was about 25, and then it just, yeah, it just becomes... A little less endearing. Yeah. Yep. No, that's true. So, but you said you guys broke up. So did you get back together then? Yeah. So she has a BPD and like, we, we have gone through a lot of like, you know, short breakups and I just, you know, with my situation where like when we break up, she has friends. I didn't have anybody. I didn't, I, if I would have been able to pull myself back, I would have seen like, this isn't a permanent thing. Even if it was a permanent thing, I don't have to do anything. But I was just, it was like going from having my person, my best friend to absolutely nothing again. And what it reminds me of is going to jail, being in jail. Once you've been in jail, you kind of get used to it. But that abrupt change of having all the freedom in the world to being locked in a cage. That's what I felt like from having my best friend to now there's literally, I go through my phone and I can't find anybody to talk to me. Uh, you know, I couldn't handle it. And that's kind of why I took the nuclear option. No, I get that. You're right. It's, uh, they call it the normative power of the actual. So it's where, like you said, because you've been to jail, you know what it's like. All of a sudden it's not so bad, but it's that initial going from this to this, you know, it, it would have been like when, if we'd gone into the original, two weeks to flatten the curve or whatever it yeah. was. If they had pulled everyone up front, oh, by the way, this shit's going to last <laughs> for a year, year and a half, it would have been like, fuck this. Hell yeah, no, yeah. this would have never flew. <laughs> but it's only like two weeks and it's a month more. Then, yeah, the creep. Then all of a sudden, you get used to it and all of a sudden it's not so bad. Yeah, it's like boiling the frog. Yep, no, exactly. It's literally exactly like yeah. that. So, your your PO goes nuclear, you have your little bender, you spend some time just recovering from that, 
and then obviously you got back together with your girl. When did that happen? What happened after that? So I, like I said, I spent about three weeks recovering in bed and now I want to try to do something like just get out of the house. So I, uh, I ended up getting only could get permission to go to walk to the local McDonald's and my little town and apply. So I, I do the application online, literally three weeks. I waited like three weeks just to get my application rejected, which I didn't know McDonald's did that. So my, yeah. Yeah. So at this, during this waiting process, I had reached out and I started talking to my ex again and she came, I couldn't leave the house. She came to the house and visited me and she wasn't supposed to, I wasn't supposed to have visitors. I told my, I texted my family. They flipped out, told her to get her out, get her out of there before, you know, they come home. So that was a disaster, but we had initiated contact again. And she had always told me that I would, could do well as like a male stripper or basically, you know, I, I I never did that well with women. I've only had like two real girlfriends, like over a month. Um, she had told me that I would do well under like the, the male gaze, I guess you could say. She always told me I, I would do very well. So I decided to just try it one day. And that's kind of, that was the initial. It was just like, I never really, I never thought I could do it. I just had no other option. I was literally stuck at my house. I just wanted something to do. Okay. Yeah. And you're referring to OnlyFans. No, this was Chatterbait I originally started on. Oh, okay. So yeah. Chatterbait. Yeah. So I just, you know, pull, pulled up my MacBook screen and I ended up, I was number one male cam that night and I made like $700 and it continued like that for a week. And I realized like, you know, there might be something here. And, you know, I never had like a good job, a career or built something of my own, you know, even though it was something I would have never imagined myself doing all of a sudden it was like, I was, I was doing something for myself. I was running, you know, I never figured myself an entrepreneurial guy, but I found myself enjoying like what I was doing. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. It just, okay. So, all right. You're doing chatterbait. You're like, holy shit. There is something to this. Like you got an audience, all that. Yeah. But then like, what, when did everything else happen? Because now you've got like YouTube channel, OnlyFans, yeah. all that shit. Like, what, so bad. So I had always kind of been a, a mild fan of prison YouTube. And I, I had tried, decided to try my hand on it at it. When I was living in the sober houses, I uploaded this video of me telling a story about how I almost got caught with $400 worth of heroin in prison. I recorded it in a literal closet. There's clothes everywhere. And it didn't really do anything special. But I had that channel. And, you know, on my Chatterbait show, it wasn't all sex. A lot of it was stories and monologuing. And I had uh, been writing a book. I say a book. I had just been writing and compiling it for about 10 years. And people would often ask me about it. And I I just decided one day, you know, everybody on Chatterbait would tell me about, did you ever get your dick sucked in prison? Like all these prison sex stories. They always want to know, like, stuff that didn't happen. So I was like, well, maybe I can talk about gays and sissies in prison. And people will like that. And I remember I recorded it and didn't really look at it. And all of a sudden, one day it just had like blown up. I couldn't believe it. And I had uh, put that, that banner on the bottom with my website and I checked my, you know, my website just had my book and a blog type stuff on it. I saw my website had got like 20,000 hits and I thought like, I have to do something with this. And I redirected it to OF and that's kind of in the month how I jumped up to like top one. Point one, dude, that's amazing. Yeah, I would have. It's weird because that's not the way people do it on YouTube. Like, it's, there, you know, there's like that whole world of like Twitter promo, and I'm trying to get into that. It's so odd to me that 99 per, or percent of my subs are like, "Yeah, I found you on YouTube." <laughs> okay, so you. Still with the same girl now. You yeah. Start on YouTube. You start on OnlyFans. What else you got going for you? Uh, you know, so I had got uh, kicked off Chatterbait for you know a lot of people have seen that video of me fainting on cam and they think that's why I got kicked off. It wasn't because of that. Um, after that happened, somebody kept asking like, "What do you need? Do you need help?" And I was like, "Bro, just talk to me on Twitter." 
And uh, they took that as like offsite communication. You know what I mean? How they don't like that. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'd like to get back into camming. Um, you know, I'm trying to help my girl with all the things I do. You know, I'm the guy who knows how to edit and shoot and film. So I've kind of been trying to like also do that production end for other people locally and try to, I'd like to transition into like using some of these video skills or something for a career after this. Yeah. It really, the biggest thing, like, obviously you're in the, the early stages of, of turning your life around. Like, you know, you still got the fucking tether bracelet yeah. and all that shit. But I, the, the biggest takeaway, at least for me personally, is you, like, from our conversation, you have all the right personality traits to be successful it's just you were channeling them into the wrong fucking shit most of your life yeah especially when i was younger um what what is hard to get across is how much uh of those years afterwards were wasted like months and months of a time where i just got used in my garage nothing happened in my life other than that um so to finally have something at all to put energy into good or bad it's like being alive again. You know, humans are meant to, to at least have some drive. Yeah. And the thing is, like, one thing I'm, I'm personally, I believe 100% is, I'm sure you're familiar with the saying, idle hands are the devil's playing yeah. around. Like, if you're not busy, that's typically when you start doing shit you shouldn't. I'll tell you, you have an amazing point in that is, I've had points in my life where I had infinite, so much more clean time than this. And I would still obsess over getting high so much. Like now that I have thing, like there's not enough hours in the day to get all I have done. I couldn't tell you what day, but there, there was a day that went by where I didn't think about heroin or fentanyl. And that had never happened to me in years. I think it happens commonly now sometimes because I just, I don't know because I don't think about it, but it used to, man, I had years of clean time and would get stuck for hours thinking about it because I had nothing going on in life. Like you said. Um, no, I, I think really the, the sky's the limit for you. Thank you. Now, because I mean, like you said, you are very articulate, very well-spoken and, I mean, I've done more than my fair share of time. And yeah, yeah, I've known plenty of people who are in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And you just spend five minutes talking to them and you're just like, yep, the cycle's never going to change. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you've known plenty of them too. Oh, yeah. They're in jail and they're telling you like their next plot, <laughs> yeah. where they went, where they went wrong. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's just, I don't know. I, I think just, yeah, if I could give you one piece of advice, though, mm -hmm. it would be don't fall victim to the golden shackles. What? What is and that? So, like, one of my exes, who's a trans woman, she got me into, like, the sex work. Uh -huh. And she's suffering from that right now is where, you know, you get into sex work and your income or, you know, your income expands. So then your bills expand to fit the available income. Oh, and yeah, you yeah. End up in a position where you can't leave. And then, you know, because you have so many revolving bills, you end up taking shoots that you know you shouldn't do, or you take clients that you probably shouldn't do. And do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, live significantly below your means. I'll tell you, this is, I hope you don't see this. So I happen to be a very frugal guy and I always am planning for disaster. So that's that causes friction in a relationship sometimes when not everybody's on that. But yeah, I don't pretend for a minute that the upward cycle doesn't, you know, I don't think it's just going to keep going up. Oh, then one day it plateaus. Like, I don't think that's how, you know, I bet it's a little more like, uh, you know, yeah. I, I try to keep it realistic. Yeah. No, I mean, cause your subscribers will fluctuate. Mine do all the time. So, oh, for sure. Yeah. There'll be good months. There'll be bad months. And 
I mean, the most important thing is just being consistent. So, yeah. But I'm curious, so like going back to what you said about having something to lose, do you feel like this is the first time in your life where like, holy shit, I've really got something going for me. I really, like now you do have something to lose. Do you feel like that? Yeah. So put it like this, Mondays are usually my report day and I had let my girl use my car for work. And I thought for a minute, yeah, obviously it was Labor Day, but I was in a panic thinking like, how, what, what if she violates it? What is going to happen to this apartment? Like, I don't live with my family anymore. Who's going to lock the door? Who's going to pay the bill? Like, I just could not comprehend what would happen if I didn't make it to that probation office. And, and that, and you know, that's a mistake. So to like purposely go out and be like, ah, I think I'm going to use and I'll just hope I don't get dropped. Like to make that gamble, like the thought hasn't crossed my mind yet. But that's the other thing is. That's the, you know, and I don't try to get into the AA-isms, but they say yet stands for you're entitled to. So I don't like to get complacent with it because I know there will be a day when either the actual accessibility is there or there's just that dreadful mood. So there, there's things I do in relation. So in my show, I don't try to talk recovery too much just because I don't think it's it's a hard topic to make interesting for non-addicts, you know? Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. It's, um, I don't know. I, I just, I, I'm just, I guess what I'm asking is what makes this time different for you? Other than what you just said about, you know, the fact you don't live with your parents, so it's all on you. Is there anything else that goes into it? I hate to, this is the, this is the hard part to admit that, you know, I've been so reliant on my family for years. It's it's sad that I was in my 30s still relying on them for those basic things. And I had people in my life tell me like, man, if they just cut you off, which is what's happened since I dated the trans woman and came out to do this, they've cut me off. Like it would actually be better for you in the long run. And I don't know why I didn't want to believe that. I didn't want to believe that my problems were based in like, me being a big baby or at least partially in that. But I think there is something too with like, I just wasn't really living. I was living life with training wheels. I had the family to fall back on. They bail me out of trouble. And that's just not how an adult, especially an adult who wants to achieve something is supposed to live. You should take risks. And if the, you know, you pay the consequences for those risks or, you know, that's part of like a real human experience, not being a child anymore, but that's how it's living like a child. So basically you got thrown in the deep end of the pool and whether you sink or swim is now up to you. Yes. And for once, floaties. exactly. And it feels, I didn't know this cause I've never done it. It feels good to pay for your own groceries. It feels good to do well, especially in an industry where it's not like you don't just go to work and get a paycheck. You got to mine that money yourself. It feels good to do it yourself. And I didn't know that before. No, I think, dude, I am beyond excited for you. Like, Thank you. I think, yeah, like I said, the world's your oyster. I mean, how high you go is totally up to you. So how much time do you have left on probation before you're done, done? Oh, first Assuming of all. There's no fuck ups. Uh, I think it would be like 20 months. And I thought you were going to say, this is my most asked question. How much longer on tether? And the answer is it's up to the PO (laughs) that people always ask. Somebody will ask in comments. Yeah. 20 months. It's not that long. Well, yeah, it's uh, it's the drug court problem that or drug court program. They re I literally just finished it. They resentenced me to it. I don't know if they're really going to make me do it all over again. They've been kind of wishy washy, but that's a, it's just a big time commitment, the driving back and forth. Yeah. So what do you mean with your PO once a week? I only have to go see my PO once every two weeks. That's about a 30 minute drive there and back. But drug court, I have to go to drop two or three, sometimes four times a week, plus meetings oh. once a week, plus court once every two. You know, it's like a lot. I literally, I will, it will wear out my car months ahead of when it, when it would have wore out otherwise. Yeah, it's thousands of miles all the other. 
Okay, so one question, and I know somebody's going to ask this because I'm going to obviously post a shirtless pic of you in the thumbnail. Yeah. <laughs> How the fuck do you stay as fucking ripped as you are with all the bullshit? You have uh, going on and- dude, I so... You know, I'm an addict and there is a like a dopamine effect to working out. And when I found when I was in prison, I would almost like abuse it. It would feel so good. Like it was the only, you know, yeah, guys got coffee in there, but it was, there's no, you know, until I got into drugs. But then when those, when I wouldn't have them, I would find that working out, running sprints, it would produce the same thing. And then I started combining the two and I, that was a big thing where I associated that. But there's something that triggers that addiction of this feels good and I'm progressing in something. And like I said, I, I, I get real hung up on social status. I was I always felt bad that I had this tether on, that I have these felonies. I'm not a homeowner. But when I go into the gym, I have something of which I am, you know, kind of a not to toot my own horn, but I'm, you know, usually one of the, you know, higher ranking guys at the gym in terms of fitness. It's like the one thing I have and in there it matters. So that's, I think that's why I latched onto it so hard. But basically I'm saying I go to the gym every day. I, I diet, I track everything I eat. It's just something I value because it's, it's so tied to now my income, but my self-esteem too. Yeah, no, it, you and I definitely have that in common. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know about you, but me personally, like I just got over being sick. So I'm sniffling a little yeah. bit. When I can't go to the gym, my mental health just... <laughs> Oh, dude, yeah, those guys. Dude, I, I signed up for this local YMCA yesterday. I'm on the treadmill. They walk up to me. They go, "Hey, by the way, we're going to be closed Friday, Saturday, Sunday." Yeah, I went in. I was ten <laughs> percent of the month. You're closed. Yeah, I went on a tizzy, bro. I don't know, I'm going back home to do some laundry and use that gym. I feel you. Okay. Yeah. And one thing you're you said you're signing a lease tomorrow. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've done. You know, a lot, like I said, talking about frugality, when I got my own apartment, I literally went to departments.com and searched by lowest price. And then I ended up doing quite well to the point where I've saved an amount, a pretty good amount. So I talked to my realtor and I'm upgrading to, uh, you know, one that's like a a little bit, 150 more a month and way bigger because this is cramped. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Are you going to make, is it a two bedroom or... No, just a really big one bedroom. Okay. Yeah, no. If I was gonna say, if you got a two bedroom, you could turn one room into like a filming room. Yeah, yeah. This is. I mean, I just wish I would have seen it. I'm just lucky that she's letting me upgrade. It's just. Uh, uh, so when I got this place, it was before the OF really, really took off. So even even accounting for if it died tomorrow, it it seemed like the smart move. Just in terms of this is very small. Okay. Good for yeah. you. Sounds like, I think that's one thing that it sounds like, too, just by listening to you and your story, you went from only seeing right here to yeah. now you're seeing, okay, what's this look like long term? What if stuff doesn't work out? Well, that's the thing is I think I was always like that. Like my family is very um, business minded, long term oriented like that. But like I said, when it comes when drugs get into the equation, All of that is bypassed because it works on such a fundamental core level of the brain. You know, I I think that's the only way to describe it, where all this, all that stuff just doesn't apply when I'm thinking about drugs. It's like, uh, you know, I know gambling addicts that they're really good at math, but they believe in superstition when it comes to gambling because it it overrides that. Interesting. Yeah. I never thought of that, but that makes total sense. Okay. Shit. All right, so for anyone who's watching this video and wants to see more of your content, all that stuff, where can they find your social media, your OnlyFans, anything and everything? Pretty simple. I'm just straight felon, one word on Twitter, and straightfelon.com will direct you to my OnlyFans. That's it? Yeah, I, I just Twitter. Uh, what I do? Yeah, OnlyFans is just straight Fallon. Twitter, OnlyFans, YouTube. Oh, my YouTube channel is straight Fallon. You check me out because you're probably watching it on this. Yeah, that's the other one. YouTube, just straight Fallon. Okay. And yeah. uh, do you have Instagram? No, I haven't been. You know, like I said, I'm new to this, and I'm having 
Is it is Instagram big on porn? I see like the gay porn is huge on Twitter, but I, I don't know Instagram culture. Okay. After this interview ends, I'll I'll give you a crash course in okay everything you need to know. Thank you. Um, and uh, for anyone, like, how would you describe your content on your only? <laughs> It's that real gay for pay. Let me tell you a little anecdote. My girlfriend's trans and she like insisted I was like a little bit bi. And after I filmed that filmed that first gay, she filmed the first gay for pay scene and the dude walked out the door. She goes, you're a lot less bi than I think. It's real gay for pay. Like, and I don't be like, and that's not like, Ugh, I think it's gross. I just try to give a genuine reaction of like, this is not something I do in my personal life, but I'm doing it for my fans. <laughs> You know, that's really what it is. And then stuff with trans women and solo stuff. But I think my main selling point is that it's some honest to God gay for Bay. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a lot of gay guys who can't stand that, but then there's yeah. a lot of gay guys that they like love that. And that's like a huge turn on. For yeah. Them. So, you know, find it. Yeah, it's, stick with it. Yeah. Thank you. It seems like some people, they want their cake and eat it too. Like, a lot of people will be like, well, don't you want to get into it, start liking it? And I'm like, well, it wouldn't be gay for pay then, really, would it? <laughs> like, yeah, no, I, I get that. I yeah. mean, hey, to each his own, whatever makes yeah. you happy. Yeah. So, no, I, I seriously, I wish you nothing but success. And I'm really happy to see, like, your life finally turning around and, you know, just your perspective change. And Thank you. Even the, the one thing you said that stuck out is, like, where you're like, I'm just too fucking old for this shit. <laughs> yeah. I can't, the pounding on walls and staying up till 4 a.m., I was like, oh, my God. This was a lot more tolerable at 23 than 33. Yep. Yeah. Oh, God. No, I get it. Um, don't go anywhere. Uh, no. For those of you watching, thank you so much for tuning thank in. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, like you said, uh, straight felon on Twitter and on, uh, just straight .com goes to his only fans Instagram. I will post his Instagram down below because I will convince him to make one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and then, uh, if you're interested in finding all my stuff, it's just at masculine Jason everywhere. If you did like this video, Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and I hope you all have an absolutely amazing week. Hey guys, just wanted to say thank you for watching this video, and if you did really enjoy it, I just wanted to mention there are two ways that you can help to support this channel. On the right side, there are three little dots. If you click those, there is a super thanks button, and on the left-hand side, there is a join button where you can join this channel there are three different tiers of memberships. The top tier does actually allow one-on-one -on -one messaging with me via Discord. And I personally answer that it is not a service. That's just, you know, both of those are ways that you can help support me as a content creator in this channel. I mention this because YouTube is by far the thing that I enjoy doing the most. It's the thing I'm most passionate about. And unfortunately, a lot of the sexual videos the porn star confessions, the dom sub, all that stuff. It is not monetized due to the nature of the videos. But either way, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you guys all have an absolutely amazing week. I love you all.